So hi everyone and welcome to quantum science seminar number 69, um, which is going to be all about relativistic effects. Um, it's wonderful to have you with us. Um, please uh, remember that we are able to take your questions on, um, on both on the YouTube live chat and also via email at uh, quantum science seminar at uh, gmail.com. Um, remember um, also that we have a short delay between what you're seeing on YouTube and the um, and the, the live broadcast, um, uh, but we'll collect your questions and, um, and ask them at various points throughout the talk. So do ask throughout. Um, and uh, uh, yeah, we're looking forward to your questions. Um, I will pass on now to Christiana, um, who's going to introduce uh, this week's speaker. Okay, uh, welcome uh, everybody also from my part and a special welcome, of course, to, to Robert. It's a pleasure to have you with us today. Um, Robert was educated in uh, Berlin and in Münster in Germany. He's a theoretical chemist who found his passion for electroweak chemistry, so for, um, I would say, fundamental physics effects in electronic structure theory during his postdoc at ETH in Zurich. And he's been... Um, He's been with his passion ever since, and today he'll start with a, a lecture on relativistic effects and then move on to their role in chiral um, molecules and fundamental physics. Robert, it's a big pleasure. I'm not taking away any more of your time. Stage is yours. You have to unmute yourself. Now I found the magic button. So thank you very much for the kind introduction. And I uh, thank you very much for the invitation to speak today at the Quantum Science Seminar. Um, the lecture today is based on a talk which I gave precisely one year ago within the framework of uh, a winter school of our um, ELCH uh, consortium. And uh, it consists of uh, two parts, as uh, Christiane mentioned, but we might have uh, also two breaks in between uh, to ask questions. And uh, so I'm happy now to entertain you for a while with uh, relativistic effects and uh, their role in uh, uh, chirality and fundamental physics. So uh, having said the title, it's maybe good to, to recall um, what relativistic effects are at all. And um, specifically in, in heavy elements, we know that the velocity, at least of some of the electrons, uh, can approach uh, the speed of light. And therefore, our usual assumption, which we have in non-relativistic descriptions, that the speed of light is um, very large compared to the uh, velocity of the particles, um, this no longer holds. And therefore, we have to account for relativistic effects and in, in, uh, describe our systems uh, with the help of relativistic theories. Now, what is then a relativistic effect? And uh, some people write it in, in quotation marks because um, actually it's, it's not normally considered to be a measurable quantity, but rather something which results from the concept that in theory we can change the speed of light according to our purposes and make it either infinitely large, which would then be the non-relativistic limit, or fix it to the actual speed of light which we have in nature, and then compare the two situations with respect to each other, and then define the difference between those two uh, calculations as relativistic effects. Well, that is what you usually hear, but um, the question is also, maybe it's possible not to really switch off relativity, but to change relativity also in nature. And that is something which is actually uh, currently discussed, namely the question if uh, fundamental constants like the fine structure constants, if they stay fixed all the time, or if they vary in time or in space. And in our theoretical uh, descriptions, we can, of course, change uh, the speed of light. And this has been done by Anna-Katharina Hansmann in my team, here for ethylene and some 
um, um, related compounds where we have fluorine, chlorine, or bromine as substituents. And then we have looked at the excitation energies as a function of the speed of light. And then here on the left of those diagrams, we would have the non-relativistic limit. And on the right, we would be on the ultra-relativistic regime where we um, have actually then a, a speed of light, which is um, uh, much um, slower um, than we have uh, observed today. And um, then we can look at the behavior of those various electronic transitions and think about if they might not be measurable by some way in our universe. And this is a topic which has already been discussed um, by uh, Dirac um, in 1983, uh, 38, uh, sorry, uh, in 1938, namely the question if fundamental constants like the fine structure constant alpha or the proton electron mass ratio, if they are really constant or change since the universe has been formed. So from astronomic measurements, we have an upper bound at the moment for this change of alpha, um, which is then relative uh, in, in relative units uh, smaller than 10 to the minus six. Or we can also do laboratory measurements and um, uh, look for um, a temporal change of uh, the fine structure constant. And if you want to read more about this, I refer you to those two articles which are mentioned down here. So one can either do laboratory measurements with atomic clocks or astronomic measurements and try to search for a variation of alpha or the proton electron mass ratio. And in molecular systems, we then have two constants which can in principle change either alpha, which um, gives as alpha squared rise to the leading order relativistic effects in molecular systems, or we can also have the change of the um, uh, proton electron mass ratio where the electronic energies are not terribly sensitive to, but the vibrational uh, levels are sensitive to the inverse square root of the proton electron mass ratio and the rotational levels are um, proportional to uh, or dependent on the inverse of the proton electron mass ratio. And in order to detect uh, such changes of uh, fundamental constants, one typically searches for situations where one has a uh, um, large sensitivity coefficient k, which is indicated here, so that upon a relative shift of our fundamental constants, we have, for instance, a relatively large shift in vibrational or electronic or whatever um, transition energies, and then we are particularly sensitive towards a change in fundamental constants. And one idea to do such a, a measurement would be to take in particular chiral molecules, which are depicted here on the left-hand side um, of this um, uh, diagram, namely that we have molecules which are uh, not superposable with their mirror images, like our hands where we have the left and the right hand, and those two um, um, uh, two minimum structures here on this potential energy hypersurface are typically then separated by some barrier so that we have a left-handed compound and a right-handed one, say, and then this barrier uh, between them. And according to Hund, we have uh, what is called a tunneling splitting between those um, two states of opposite parity here. And the dependence of this splitting here is very strongly on the um, ratio between the proton and electron mass. So in those systems, we would be particularly sensitive uh, towards the change of this um, fundamental constant, the ratio between those two masses. So having said this, uh, molecular systems can in principle also reveal a change in the fundamental constants and therefore to some extent, we can say also it might be possible in an experiment to actually change or modify the relativistic effects because they depend on alpha squared in leading order. Now, having said this, we can um, look at the menu of uh, this lecture here. So I want to start with um, a small recap of relativity and its role in chemistry, then a bit about the general concepts of uh, special relativity, and then the description with the help of the Dirac equation versus the non-relativistic Schrödinger equation. And then we will come to the um, second uh, part of this talk, the description within uh, different 
electronic structure approaches, which we call four component, two component, or one component. Then we will have a quick look at the atomic orbitals, which we get from a relativistic description, and then the relativistic effects on molecular structures that will then complete the first, but the major part of this um, contribution. And then in the second part, we talk about the impact on chirality and fundamental physics, which we can have from relativistic effects. So having said this, we start with the first part here, relativity and the role in chemistry. And here I highlight um, uh, figures from um, the close work who studied the orbital contraction or expansion of orbitals under the influence of relativistic effects. And here we see, for instance, on the um, upper diagram, hydrogen-like systems, so single electron systems. And here as a function of the nuclear char uh, charge, we see the increase in the binding energy of the uh, various s orbitals, 1s, 2s, 3s, 4s. And we see here, interestingly enough, that there is a non-linear um, dependence of this increase of the binding energy of the s orbitals uh, upon the um, um, main quantum number or principal quantum number, namely the largest effect and the largest increase in the binding energy is actually for the 2s orbital and not for the 1s orbital as one might naively expect. Um, along with this increase in binding energy, we have the contraction of the orbitals. Here's the expectation value of the radius um, of each of the orbitals shown. And we see here that the 1s and 2s orbitals have the strongest contraction, and then uh, come the higher lying ones. And compared to the single electron systems, we can also have a quick look at what will come later, namely the multi-electron systems. And here we see the variations in the radii uh, or the expectation value of the radius of the outermost um, orbital, which is uh, occupied in those uh, various elements here as a function of the nuclear charge. And then we see that the s orbitals and the so-called p3, uh, one half orbitals, that they typically contract um, due to relativistic effects. Then we compare here relativistic to non-relativistic effects as a ratio, whereas the p3 half orbitals remain more or less unchanged. And for the d and f orbitals, we typically have an expansion uh, so that they become actually larger um, due to this uh, contraction of the s and p orbitals, which are then more efficiently shielding the nuclear charge. This is orbital contraction and expansion. Another example for the importance of relativistic effects, which is frequently used, um, is the color of gold. So in a non-relativistic world, which is shown here on the left, silver and gold would have essentially the same splitting between the uh, d and the s orbitals, and an electronic excitation would then not be in the visible range. But due to the orbital contraction of the one uh, of the s orbitals and the expansion of the d orbitals and the additional splitting due to spin-orbit coupling, we get a lower energy difference between those two orbitals, and therefore gold absorbs indivisible and therefore gets this golden color, which is um, typical for gold. And uh, so you can say in a non-relativistic world, uh, gold would be silver. Um, another example is um, that mercury is liquid at room temperature. And I refer you to this work of Peter Schwertfeger and his team in Eingewandte Chemie from, uh, from 2013, where they have looked at the importance of uh, relativistic effects on the melting point of, um, um, uh, of mercury. Another example uh, is spin-orbit coupling. Um, the famous example is the uh, sodium D line, which is depicted here, which is uh, uh, split due to spin orbit coupling. This is known since the early 19th century for lithium. The corresponding transition here um, uh, um, is um, um, uh, uh, the splitting is so small that it's not resolved on this scale here. And for potassium, the splitting here becomes uh, larger. And this sodium D-line splitting is um, uh, known for, for a long time. Um, but one has to emphasize it's really the spin-orbit coupling and not the spin itself, which is a relativistic effect. So it's a coupling between those angular momentum. 
And related to spin orbit uh, coupling is the effect of phosphorescence, where we have, for instance, an electronic ground state, which is a singlet state of a molecular system, say, and then we do an electronic excitation into another higher lying singlet state. And then if there is a nearby triplet state, then there can happen what is called inter-system crossing to this triplet manifold. Internal conversion can bring us down to the vibrational ground state. And from here on, the lifetime is very long. And then we can occasionally see uh, photons being emitted. And this is then a signature of phosphorescence for which the lifetimes are relatively long due to spin orbit coupling, um, which makes this process allowed. Whereas in a non-relativistic world, this process here would be forbidden. And the last effect, which I want to highlight um, is uh, the inert pair effect. Here is shown the redox potential of tin um, versus lead. And here we see that it's comparatively easy to remove the first two electrons in tin and lead. And uh, the potential which is needed is essentially the same. But when it comes to removal of the second two electrons, the so-called inert pair, then it becomes more difficult. And it becomes much more difficult to remove the two electrons from lead than from tin. And this has been highlighted in this very nice work of Pekka Pückel and colleagues in Physical Review Letters, where they have investigated the lead battery and the influence of uh, relativistic effects on the performance of the lead battery. And there's a, a maybe not original um, a quote, how I rephrase, uh, or how I give it now, but I, it's a, a phrase like, we want to mention that cars start due to relativity. So in a non-relativistic world, uh, a lead uh, battery would maybe not be able to start our cars. So this is a quick overview of the various relativistic effects. And now I want to quickly come to the basics of uh, special relativity. And of course, we all know the, the uh, principle that we say that the fundamental laws of, of physics are the same in, in uh, each uh, reference frame. Um, if they move relative to each other with a constant velocity, so there is no preference for one specific inertial frame of reference. And this is the, the principle of uh, special uh, relativity. Here, it's important that we say we have constant velocity and that they um, move with uh, respect to each other. And this we bring now in contrast to um, the Galilei relativistic um, principle, where we just say if we have um, uh, two uh, uh, frames here, one which is at rest and the other one which is moving with the velocity here along the x-axis. And we have some particle or object here in this um, a moving uh, reference frame. Then if we want to give the coordinates in this um, a reference uh, frame, which is here at rest in this picture, then we can just calculate those corresponding coordinates if we know the velocity and uh, the time um, uh, which we have at the moment, but the times are the same in the two reference frames. And we can just add up the velocities, and here it becomes evident that we get a certain problem if we have velocities which are close to the speed of light, because then if we add them up, then we can get um, uh, velocities or speeds which are uh, larger than the speed of light. But the speed of light should be constant in all the reference frames, and therefore um, we have. Um, this concept of uh, the Lorentz transformation to go from one reference frame to another one. Um, and uh, this makes the equation here a bit more complicated to calculate um, the coordinates here if in this special case that we move along the x direction. And here enters the so-called Lorentz factor, where we have the ratio between the uh, velocity or, uh, or the speed with uh, which we are moving with our coordinate system and our reference frame, and here the speed of light. So if this ratio here is very much smaller than one, then we get to the Galilei relativistic principle. But once we get close to the speed of light, and then we see that we have here dramatic changes of this transformation. And the velocity composition rule becomes also much more complicated, even for this quite simple case where we just move along one direction. And um, but it's uh, relieving to know that in the limit that this ratio here goes to zero, we go back to the Galilei transformation laws, which are then the basics uh, for our non-relativistic description of electronic uh, structure. Now, 
to summarize, the consequence of this Lorentz transformation is that we have this more complicated velocity composition rule, that we have the length contraction. So if, for instance, a round object is moving with a very high velocity, then this appears in a, a different uh, a frame, which um, is maybe um, uh, not moving with uh, uh, or is, is uh, at rest and the other one is, is moving, then those objects become very much compressed so that a round object actually looks more like a pizza um, moving in, in one direction. And uh, this is one of the um, uh, obvious uh, cases of um, uh, the length contraction. We also have the time dilation, which is uh, related then to, to the twin paradoxon um, relativistic mass increase, and of course also the question of what is a simultaneously happening process where we also have to apply the principles of relativity. Now, what is the consequence uh, for, for energies? Here we have the uh, famous Einstein equation where we have E is equal to m uh, c squared, but here in the squared relation where we actually also have the momenta and um, the masses of our particles. And if we uh, work in a classical picture, well, then we can formulate uh, the related classical Hamiltonian by just taking the square root of this energy term and then we have our Hamiltonian. Um, but for uh, quantum mechanics, this is then complicated because we have a square root expression and here we would have the momentum. So here immediately the question arises how to quantize this object. And for this then came the idea of Dirac, um, who introduced the Dirac equation in order to deal with this problem. And Dirac's idea was to try to find a Schrödinger-like equation um, which contains first derivatives and now both with respect to time and space coordinates. And then upon squaring, one should get back to this energy expression, which we have here, or to the Klein-Gordon equation, um, which um, then relates to the squared quantities. And if one makes this ansatz here like Dirac, then we can introduce here in front of uh, d by dx and d by dy and d by dz um, the uh, uh, quantities A, uh, alpha X, alpha Y, and alpha Z. And we can also introduce this better here. And then upon squaring of this equation, we should get back to this expression here. And in order to achieve this, it becomes clear that our alphas and betas cannot just be numbers, uh, but rather should be matrices. And then we have here the time-dependent Dirac equation, which we can then solve with those matrices. And for those matrices, we have some standard choices. So alpha is typically composed here um, on the off-diagonal block by the sigma matrices that are the Pauli two by two matrices and uh, beta is then composed of the unit matrix and the negative of the unit matrix. And if we use those uh, four matrices, which are four by four matrices, then upon squaring, we get to the Klein-Gordon equation. So in this sense, uh, the problem um, uh, of how to deal um, with relativity in principle in terms of an equation which one can quantize um, becomes clear. But then the question is, what is in, uh, now the effect of solving this uh, Dirac equation? This here would be the free particle Dirac equation where we have then the momentum connected with um, a momentum operator connected with the alpha matrix and here the mass of the particle connected with this beta matrix. And um, then we can go from this here to the time independent um, free particle Dirac equation, which very much looks like um, uh, uh, in the Schrödinger equation. Like, um, so we have an eigenvalue equation here where we get our energy plus um, the rest mass of our particle. So we have those two different ways of looking at the energy, W and E, where we have shifted our energy by mc squared. Now, how does the spectrum of a free particle, uh, ah, before we do this, uh, let's look at the consequence of using four by four matrices um, in order uh, to get after squaring to the Klein-Gordon equation. Um, here we uh, see that we, um, or something which resembles the Klein-Gordon equation, we get then wave functions which consist of four components, psi one, two, three, and four. And they are usually split up into uh, two components, an upper two component and a lower 
two components, so phi and chi. And um, since we get our energy as the square root of uh, this expression here, um, but we can take the positive or the negative um, uh, square root here, we get besides positive energies, also negative energies. And for positive energy solutions, then phi is larger than chi. And this is why this is also often called the large component. If we have in mind that we uh, worry about positive energies, and this here is then called the uh, small component, or as I indicated here, indicated here upper and lower component. Now let's look at the spectrum. Um, in principle, we have now a negative energy continuum, which uh, starts at minus mc squared. Then we have a gap here. And then we have the positive energy continuum, which starts from uh, mc squared on. And if we use a shifted expression, then we have our edge here for the positive energy uh, states at zero. And that's a typical convention, which is used in order to make the non-relativistic description um, as similar um, uh, as possible to the relativistic description. And of course, the negative energy solutions then needed some interpretation. And uh, the usual interpretation is that if we have a hole in the negative energy continuum, this corresponds then to um, positrons, and then we can con uh, construct positron and electron pairs um, by making such a transition from this negative energy uh, states to the positive energy states. Um, we are not so much interested in free particles when it comes to chemistry and uh, atomic physics. So typically, we include then some potential, and in our case, typically the Coulomb potential to describe the attraction of the electrons by the positively charged nucleus. And this can be done to add the potential then as a, uh, with this 4 by 4 unit matrix to our um, 4 by uh, 4 matrix. Um, uh, expression here. So this here would be the full representation of our um, um, uh, of our matrix, uh, which we have here, our four component wave function. And then if we want to solve for the eigen energies, then we have to set this to zero and find our values of W. And typically we write this in this two by two block structure, where we have here on the diagonal block, uh, the potential and the energy here shifted uh, by a minus 2mc squared in the lower block here. And then on the off diagonal, we have c times sigma times p, um, which is then related um, in the variant to the kinetic energy when we have those two off diagonal blocks. And this equation we can then solve. This leads then to additional bound states if we have an um, a potential which is attractive. Um, on this side here, whereas for the negative energy continuum, there is not the, uh, so to speak, uh, um, uh, competing part in the negative energy states where we also have discrete levels, but we have here in this range then additional discrete levels, um, which are then describing the bound states of our electrons, um, which are attracted then by a positively charged nucleus. And when we then solve, for instance, the Dirac equation for a hydrogen-like atom, then we get, uh, as compared to the non-relativistic spectrum, which is shown here on the right, where we have the s one half orbitals, and then we have the s and p two p orbitals, which are then degenerate, and then the two s, uh, the s, p, and t orbitals for the main quantum number, where n is equal to three, we get in the relativistic um, uh, expression here an additional splitting of the levels so that the p1 half and p3 half degeneracy is lifted, um, which we had before in the non-relativistic world. But in the relativistic world, we have this additional splitting. And then we go higher up, then we again see splittings between the 1 half and 3 half uh, levels and also 5 half levels, which we can observe here. And the indicated example of a D-line, um, of the sodium D-line would be corresponding to higher levels actually uh, result then from uh, the P1 half and P3 half um, uh, orbitals, which are occupied, and then 
uh, the emission would take place if an electron goes down into a, the lower lying s orbital. And since we have this additional splitting here, we see the sodium D line. Here, uh, the energy expression, and also um, this term here explains this nonlinear dependence um, of the relativistic energy uh, on the um, main quantum number n here, uh, which we have seen before, so that actually in the hydrogen like atoms, um, this level, uh, the 2s uh, orbital, has the um, strongest relativistic effect on the additional binding energy. And we feature um, uh, here again alpha, our fine structure constant, which is uh, roughly one divided by 137, and which uh, in, in atomic uh, units, so to speak, is then uh, proportional to, to the inverse of the speed of light. This is a spectrum which we get, but uh, how do the energy levels look like? Let's see if I, uh, how do the orbitals look like? Um, and this is then uh, shown here, namely the um, orbital energies, uh, which we have, they are always uh, lower than the uh, non-relativistic ones. We have the largest stabilization for the one-half orbitals. The radial electron density contracts towards the nucleus. This is what we have mentioned in the beginning already, this relativistic contraction of the orbitals. And the radial and angular nodes of the density are partially removed um, due to um, having an upper and a lower component with interlaced nodes, so that where the non-relativistic wave functions really has uh, zeros, um, our density in the relativistic uh, framework um, uh, then has finite values, and this is due to the two different components which we have. The spin-orbit coupling lifts this orbital degeneracies, and our relativistic effect scale with z to the power of four. And we can now have a quick look at what would happen for multi-electron atoms. There, the degeneracy of orbitals with the same j, but different l is lifted. So an s one half and a p one half orbital, they are no longer degenerate in this, um, uh, when we solve the Dirac equation, and this would be lifted. Um, and the orbitals with j equals one half, so the s one half and p one half orbitals, they typically contract as we have seen in the beginning in the plots, j equals three half, they remain essentially unchanged, and j larger than three half expand when compared to the non-relativistic orbitals, and the relativistic effects then scale not z to the power of four, but with z effective to the power of two, and then z squared. This is the um, atomic uh, single and multi-electron uh, situation, and this could be a good point for the first stop um, if there are questions from the audience. Okay, there are. Um, so the, they, ref they relate to the uh, introductory part of your lecture. Um, so the first one is, are there substantial differences between the type of relativistic effects we see for electrons in molecules as opposed to atoms? And if so, does it just come from a larger potential or also from the more complicated uh, orbitals? Um, I think the most of the relativistic effects are mostly atomic in nature. And uh, so therefore, um, what we learn from atoms, um, this we can to some extent well transfer to molecular systems. So um, in, in the molecular system, typically we don't have an additional enhancement of the relativistic effects themselves because they are mostly um, caused by the behavior of the electrons close to one of the nuclei. Um, I was a bit vague with my statement because you can also create hypothetical short-lived molecules by squashing two nuclei very close to each other. And then, of course, the situation is, is um, uh, different. If you have high energy collisions between two nuclei, uh, then you can have uh, different types of short-lived uh, molecules. And there, of course, you can enhance 
um, the effect because you have then two very close lying nuclei, which can have even a charge which is, is larger than the uh, nuclear charges, which are currently realized by the elements which we know. So maybe this answers already the, the next question, uh, but I'm sing still going to uh, pose it anyway. Um, so are we equally able to probe fundamental physics using relativistic eff effects in atoms and molecules, or is it more significant than molecules? Is there an advantage to molecules? Um, we will come to this point later, and then I think it will become clear why we can have advantages with molecules, uh, because some of the things can be suppressed um, in a well-chosen molecule, which otherwise would be the dominant effect in an atomic system. And by this, one can go for certain quantities like an anapole moment, and we will see this later, um, which is difficult to, uh, but possible to measure in atomic systems and has been measured for the cesium atom. Um, but in a diatomic molecule, the major contribution, the nuclear spin independent effect would be very much suppressed so that we don't have to see this small effect on the background of a huge other effect and rather see only, so to speak, the nuclear spin dependent term. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So in relativistic atomic physics, sometimes people say that there is JJ coupling rather than just LS. Mm -hmm. So is there more complicated physics of spin orbit in the relativistic limit? And how important is this for heavy nuclei? So yes, the coupling situation plays an important role and uh, we will come to this later when we see how this influences the situation in molecules and it gives rise to very interesting effects. Okay, now comes the last and maybe the most tricky question uh, for that uh, block. So to what extent can we intuitively link the effects that you described, like the orbital shifts, uh, the color of gold or the melting point of mercury? to straightforward pictures that we might build from semi-classical theory and an understanding of relativity in classical mechanics. I mean, they are mathematical consequences of the Dirac equation, but can we bridge to classical relativity conceptually in a simple picture? To be honest, I, I don't know. Yes, it's a tricky question. And to be honest, I cannot answer. So mm -hmm. it might be possible, but I'm not qualify to to give their clear answer to this okay well then i think we already had two questions that alluded to the second part um i would say okay yeah then we continue with the uh, second part um where we look a bit at how we um solve um the uh, multi-electron um uh, equations and this brings us to the description with four, two, and one components, um, which I want to um, introduce to you. Um, and But I guess most in the, uh, of you in the audience know, of course, about the various methods, namely um, just to, to introduce the language also, which is uh, commonly used in order to distinguish the different approaches. Um, we speak of four component methods, and they are called also relativistic me methods. Some people call it also fully relativistic, um, but relativistic uh, describes it quite well for the reasons you will see in a second. Um, and the more technical term is four component methods because there we include in our calculations all the four components um, of our uh, single electron uh, wave functions in order to describe then the multi-electron systems. Um, we can also go to two component methods and they are also called quasi relativistic um, because um, here we to some extent try to avoid two uh, components of our four component uh, description and try to implicitly uh, get information on this and an even more approximate approach um, in a sense would be to go to scalar relativistic or one component methods um, which then typically do not contain spin-orbit coupling right from the onset, but then uh, often spin-orbit coupling is introduced perturbatively. And the most frequently used method um, 
even of um, just practitioners of uh, quantum chemistry codes is that one uses relativistic effective core potentials. So then one does essentially a relativistic calculation without even knowing about it um, because all the relativistic effects are then included in the uh, uh, effective core potential or pseudo potential in order to account for uh, the major contributions from relativity. And this is uh, roughly the outline, and we will now go quickly through this. So we start with the four component methods. The idea is then that our one electron Dirac equation, uh, where we have a single electron a Dirac operator here in the time um, uh, independent picture, um, is our starting point. But the question would be how to describe then a multi electron system. And the idea is, of course, then to introduce as a new naive starting point, uh, just the Coulombic interaction between the two electrons, so that we just say we have something which is proportional to the inverse of the internuclear distance, and then some additional constants here. And this two electron term, we just add to our Hamiltonian, and then sum over all the pairs which we have um, in our system, so that we have pairwise, but purely Coulombic interactions between two electrons. But of course, if you think about this, then this purely Coulombic interaction does not really fit into this Lorentz uh, relativistic picture because it means that we have an instantaneous but a long range interaction. And as of yet, there is not yet a fully relativistic description of the electron-electron interaction, which we uh, can include in our um, uh, in our electronic structure calculations, but at least some approximations uh, to it, which uh, come then from, from an expansion. And that is that one includes also effects due to the finite speed of propagation of electromagnetic uh, signals, an additional term to the Coulomb term. And this is then often called the bright term, which um, then describes even also the retarded magnetic interactions between two current distributions, which we can then have here. So besides the Coulombic term, we have this term here where the alpha matrices of the different electrons enter and where we have the inter um, uh, electronic distance and uh, the dependence of the second part is um, the uh, uh, inverse of the um, uh, inter-electronic uh, uh, distance cubed. And the first term here goes with one over Rij. Um, and those two additional terms then give rise in a non-relativistic expansion of this to different effects, which one can discuss in, for instance, the spin, other orbit coupling terms and so forth, um, which are then important to describe the electron-electron interaction beyond the simple Coulombic interaction. But from a pragmatic point of view, because the bright interaction is more complicated to describe, many calculations are actually done in the Dirac Coulomb framework, and then maybe perturbatively later on the bright interaction is included in order to make estimates about the impact on the electronic structure. And since there is now um, a Hamiltonian available with which we can do the calculation. Then we come to the typical method cube, which we have in electronic structure theory, namely that we have now three different axes with which we can, uh, so to speak, improve our description, which we have. One is the one particle description, or as we say in electronic structure theory, the basis sets which we are using. They can be very simple and very small and can be uh, become complete in the limit. Um, that is one axis on which we can improve, so to speak, the quality of our calculation. We can in improve the quality of our Hamiltonian. For instance, we start just with the Dirac Coulomb Hamiltonian, and then we include the bright interaction, for instance, or we include further interactions which are not just electromagnetic in nature, but also include, for instance, the weak interaction and uh, also interactions beyond uh, where we leave our current standard model of particle physics. And then we have the end particle description, which uh, typically means that we can use, for instance, Slater determinants and then start with a single Slater determinant picture as a very approximate method and then increase the quality by accounting for more excitations, for instance, 
in on a level of uh, coupled cluster theory that includes singles and doubles excitation up to triples excitation and so forth or we use a configuration interaction expansion so all this what we know from re non-relativistic theory could also be possible in the relativistic framework and the goal would of course to be uh, to reach this corner here where we have a complete one particle and uh, full ci or full configuration interaction description and the complete hamilton including all the possible additional interactions in order to describe then our systems as accurately as possible. And I will in the following just go to the very uh, easy starting point of all this, namely the pendant of uh, the Hartree-Fock equation um, in the four component picture, namely that one makes the ansatz that we have here the um, Dirac Coulomb Hamiltonian and maybe also the uh, bright interaction included. And then if we want to go to a Hartree-Fock-like description, we can say that we guess that our wave function can be described by a single Slater determinant phi tilde. And then we optimize this with the constraint that we have orthonormalized orbitals. And then we come to a pseudo eigenvalue equation, which looks like the Hartree-Fock equation. Um, but here it's a Dirac uh, Coulomb um, uh, uh, Fock uh, and uh, uh, Bright or uh, uh, Dirac Coulomb Bright Fock equation, which we can have here. And from this, we get orbital energies in our multi electron system. And we have the Fock operator, which we can include here, which contains the uh, one electron Dirac operator and then the Coulomb and exchange terms in a four component framework, but based on this electron electron interaction term. And if we write this down now um, in, in the following form, we can um, uh, have here our um, uh, 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 Coulomb and exchange type operators, um, which we can either write in this form here on a four component um, scheme, or we can use this block uh, structure, the two by two blocks, where we see that we have here the um, uh, nuclear uh, attraction on the diagonal again. Here we have the conventional two electron Coulomb interaction. And here we have the exchange, which is then popping up here on the various blocks. And then we solve, like in the non-relativistic world, um, the Dirac, uh, Hartree, Fock, Coulomb, um, bright equations in order to um, uh, get to orbitals and their corresponding energies. And here, again, as in the one electron case, we have orbitals, which have four components. And they can have uh, two upper and two lower components. Um, and those, um, uh, and of course, we can also get negative energy states as in the one electron picture. Now, the next step, what we can do is instead of describing everything in a four component framework, we can go to a quasi relativistic description and the idea here is that typically in atomic physics and in uh, molecular physics and chemistry, we are mostly interested in the positive energy part of the spectrum, whereas typically pair creation and positronic excitations are of le less relevance in low energy um, applications. So typical chemical situation or molecular physics situation. And thus, um, it is tempting to try to get rid of the lower two components from the um, equations and just uh, focus on the upper components and then try to um, achieve this by block diagonalization of the Hamiltonian so that we have a positive and an energy uh, negative energy part of the spectrum. This is illustrated here. So uh, just formally, we have our Dirac um, um, uh, Hamiltonian representation with the help of the matrix here. Then we can introduce a unitary matrix U and this unitary matrix U is chosen such that we block diagonalize this um, uh, four by four matrix into a uh, block, um, which is here the upper uh, two by two block and the lower two by two block, so that we have an H plus and an H minus. And at the same token, we also have to transform our four component wave function, which has a four component upper two component and lower two component to pseudo upper and pseudo lower components. And the pseudo lower components then contain all the information about the positive part of the energy spectrum. 
for the case that we have no additional potential. This is analytically known as a free particle foley voithausen transformation. But once we switch on an additional potential, uh, then it gets a bit more tricky. And um, this is then um, what one has to solve um, because here it's not analytically known, but then one has to do this numerically. So typically we are only interested in the positive energy part and they are called often the electronic solutions and the negative energy part are sometimes called the positronic solutions, although it's holes in the negative energy uh, part, which then correspond to the positron part. But it's very important to remember that the upper component from a four-component um, four description or the upper two components of a four-component description are not the same as a pseudo-upper component. Um, and uh, so uh, here's the difference between the two. And therefore, if it comes to the construction of a four-component density, uh, that is not the same as just um, taking the um, pseudo-upper components and then constructing from this a density. And the same also holds for the operators. It would be wrong just to say, oh, I take this upper upper block of some operator where we want to calculate the expectation value of and just use the pseudo large component. This has been termed the picture change. So if one describes um, the system consistently, one also has to transform the corresponding operators so that one gets a consistent description of the operators with this in this um, two component picture. This one has to keep in mind also when one calculates the electron electron interactions. And this brings us here to the general idea of infinite order two component methods, which are also called uh, exactly transform two component methods. So here the idea is instead of trying to find this block diagonalization of the Hamiltonian on the operator level, one instead does a matrix expansion of everything. And then one can uh, do the calculation, the infinite order uh, two component calculation on the matrix level in some finite uh, basis set uh, scheme. And for this very efficient schemes have been proposed so that one can say, well, Essentially, four component calculations can be made as fast as two component calculations, or two component calculations can be made as good as four component calculations. So that some old battle, which was around between four and two components, is one better than the other, uh, that this can be considered to be solved now. Namely, one can make everything as accurately and as fast as um, um, possible as, as the other approach if one uses certain well-controlled approximations and tricks. And there's one special variant which we in the team use often, which is called the ZORA, the zeroth order regular approximation, and goes back to Chang, Pelisier, and Durand. And the name ZORA comes, however, from um, the Netherlands uh, team from Van Lente, Barens, and Snyders, um, who uh, developed this uh, method independently. And the idea here is that this block matrix structure is then used in order to get uh, from this lower part here an expression for the lower two components, which are then related here exactly to the upper two components. And then comes the important trick of the Zora approximation, namely that this um, inverse uh, of the operator then is split up into two terms so that we have 2mc squared minus v and the inverse of this. And we have this expression here where we have a, a second inverse here for which we then do a series expansion. And the series expansion then is stopped at zeroth order. And the advantage is that this term here um, uh, remains regular for um, not too high energies. And then one can um, use this expression here and uh, get in zeroth order to this approximate expression for the lower two components uh, when one knows the upper two components. And then with this, chi i can be eliminated from the upper equation, which we have seen here. Um, and uh, so we solve now the upper equation, but eliminate chi i with this approximate expression here and come to this expression, uh, which is indicated here, where only the um, uh, upper component here pops up explicitly. 
And it has been pointed out by Van Vullen in this paper that in multi-electron systems, it's good to replace this V here by a model potential, which is very important for doing molecular calculations. In an atomic uh, picture, that's not necessary, but uh, for molecular calculations, one can then introduce a more or less atomic model potentials in order to um, alleviate a problem uh, of this expression here, namely the gauge dependence of the Zohar equation. And um, there's the alternative approach, which is the, the typical textbook example, namely the Pauli approach, where this inverse here is then just approximated by the inverse of 2mc squared. And um, then one gets to the bright Pauli expression and then um, can try to uh, solve um, uh, the uh, two component uh, calculations with this ansatz here. But this has a drawback um, that the spectrum is typically not bounded from below because we have this p to the four operator here with the negative sign. So if we have very steep functions, then this can go to uh, minus infinity and that creates uh, a lot of problems. The Zora approximation is regular in the sense, and so therefore uh, this problem is then avoided with the Zora approach. Instead of using two components, one can also say, well, spin orbit effects are not so important for certain aspects. So let's try to work without spin orbit coupling in the one component picture. And uh, in the Zora, for instance, one can just um, uh, indicate how the transition is made by just saying wherever we have sigma times p popping up, we just replace it by p, and then we come to this one component Zora expression uh, where spin orbit coupling is then not included. And so we just get the so called scalar relativistic effects included, but not uh, spin orbit coupling. And the um, uh, Zora can typically safely be used uh, variationally. Uh, that's important what I wanted to highlight here. Um, and uh, the electron spin independent terms of the bright Pauli Hamiltonian, um, like mass velocity it's called, and one and two electron D Darwin and two electron spin orbit, uh, they should be used in lowest order perturbation theory only. Um, and because if, if one goes to higher orders, then uh, problems emerge. So typically one will always um, uh, stop at uh, lowest order and uh, will not go to higher order because then uh, problems emerge. And then we come to the last uh, approach, namely the relativistic effective core potential methods. Here the idea is to just work with um, uh, the valence electrons of a system because mostly in chemistry, but often also in atomic physics, we are interested in the behavior of the valence electrons and not so much of the inner um, uh, core uh, electrons. And uh, in this respect, one does a lot of additional work by solving equations for the inner electrons if uh, we are only interested in the outer valence electrons and uh, would rather like to get rid of this additional effort. And so the idea is to replace the effect of the inner electrons, which they have on the valence electrons by some effective potential, which is then mimicking the behavior of the um, inner electrons and under the influence of relativistic effects. So we take into account the relativistic effects on the inner electrons and then try to get, uh, so to speak, the relativistic effects on the outer uh, electrons and valence electrons um, described with the help of some pseudo potentials. And this is illustrated here with this figure from uh, Wikipedia, where instead of this um, uh, one over R attraction due to the Coulombic um, uh, attraction from the nucleus, um, we switch to a pseudo potential where the pseudo potential then describes uh, the shielding and the repulsion of the inner electrons on the outer electrons here, for instance, one which has a, a relatively high uh, principal quantum number. And then the idea of the pseudo potential approaches is that one tries to have a certain cutoff region, for instance, where then the pseudo wave function and the 
um, uh, relativistic wave function, they have the same dependence, but then the inner part and the nodal structure is then, for instance, replaced um, by some pseudo um, wave function. And this is then called the pseudo potential approach, where one smooths out, so to speak, the behavior here and finds a pseudo potential. And there are different flavors of this. One is called shape consistent, so that one tries to uh, match here the behavior. The other one is energy consistent pseudo potentials, where one tries to find a pseudo potential which describes then either experimentally obtained data or calculated theoretical data for atomic systems, for instance, and then tries to find a pseudo potential which then uh, reproduces the energy level structure uh, caused by transitions of the valence electrons. Whereas model potentials, they try to uh, keep the nodal structure of the valence orbitals um, uh, like that of the all electron calculation, so that we still try to get the same behavior here, but with the help of uh, model potential. And this now completes the overview of the uh, description with four, two, and one components. And now we have a quick look at what is the impact then of, of using this. And here I have shown uh, this uh, um, figures for the radial profiles calculated for the 1s. 2s and 2p and so forth orbitals here. And it might be difficult to see, but we have a dashed line here, which represents a non-relativistic behavior and the uh, solid line, which represents then the relativistic solution. And then we see that the density um, uh, computed here um, uh, is um, closer to the uh, origin where the nucleus is. So this represents then the contraction of our relativistic orbitals. And this also holds for the 2s orbitals, which are then compressed here. And what is also important to note is that the non-relativistic orbitals have here an additional node. So when the density really becomes zero here, uh, the relativistic one, uh, this density really does not become fully zero here because we have the small component where the nodal uh, nodes are uh, displaced with respect to the large component. And therefore, this node is here in principle washed out. And then we can also look at the higher orbitals. So in a sense, right, um, here we have a contraction of our orbitals, as we has, have mentioned before, but here we see the corresponding radial profiles. And therefore, one would expect that, um, naively speaking, that if we form now bonds between relativistic atoms, and uh, gold is a, a wonderful example, Pekka Pücke says it's a relativistic maximum, uh, which we have for gold. Here, if we have, for instance, a gold-gold bond and describe it with a non-relativistic uh, approach, then this here would be the bond length and the uh, binding energy. And with a relativistic approach, we have a much shorter bond length. Here, the distances are given in, in uh, Bohr radii and the energies are given in Hartree. And uh, then we see the stabilization. I should note um, the energies here given in Hartree, it's O dot and then zero, zero. So somehow this is uh, missing in this uh, print here. Um, so we have here uh, uh, point one. Um, Hartree um, uh, down here and here would be the uh, binding level. And we see that for gold 2 or gold hydride or gold chloride, we always have a shortened bond. And the naive picture then would be, yes, of course, the orbitals contract and therefore um, we get a um, reduction in the bond length. But as has been worked out by these authors here, that's not the true story because the orbital contraction is only a second order effect and is not as important as taking the non-relativistic wave function, but the relativistic operators. And here we see the first order effect is the one which really steeply depends on the bond length. And this orbital contraction contribution here is only a smaller contribution. So it's, uh, so to speak, due to the operators, which is then creating this um, so to speak, change in the bond length. And it's not the naive picture, oh yeah, the orbitals contract and therefore we have this huge effect, right? This, um, uh, Pekka Pücke refers to this as a Dutch revolution uh, because here um, this uh, the authors um, pointed this out because it was against the 
um, normal understanding that it's uh, due to the um, uh, contraction of the orbitals. Now, uh, besides the uh, uh, radial behavior, we can also look at the angular behavior. And here I uh, show a figure from, uh, from Schabo in this Journal of Chemical Education, where we see that the S1 half orbital, but also the P1 half orbital, they have a spherical density. And um, then if one goes to the uh, P3 half orbitals, then they become donut-like. Here we have the peanut-like behavior of the P uh, of the uh, P3 half one half orbital and uh, so forth. And here we have the um, uh, uh, main quantum number n equals three, where we have also d orbitals, and there we have the d3 half and five half orbitals. And for this we have the components j three half and one half, and here we have five half, three half, and uh, uh, one half. And um, uh, uh, sorry, the m uh, components. And here. Um, we can now look at uh, the um, corresponding pictures uh, by assembling, for instance, our uh, set of p orbitals, um, either in this um, the large components here now uh, from this um, uh, from the pz and px and py orbitals, which we typically use in non-relativistic calculations to have real orbitals, and then we see that they consist of two components an alpha component and a beta component. This here would be the P one half M one half orbital where we have PZ and PX and PY. And here we also have the imaginary unit so that we have two real components and an imaginary one, which is indicated in this picture here. And if we put everything together, we get this spherical density out. This here would be the P three half, one half orbitals and so forth. And of course, we can use them as a basis in order to describe the conventional PX, PY and PZ orbitals, which we have in our non-relativistic description. So depending on the coupling situation, this here would be the JJ coupling. This here would be then the situation where we uh, work with uh, the L and then subsequently S coupling when we uh, go to the different description. So here we use a conventional PX, PY, PZ orbitals, alpha spin, and they can be obtained from the ones where we have an alpha and beta spin component and uh, the uh, superpositions of those various orbitals in order to describe the conventional ones. Now on the next page, um, oh, there is a figure missing, which I had included, but now for some reason it's missing here. Um, and that is, oh, that's very unfortunate, um, but uh, yeah, we cannot help it. Um, here, um, uh, this has now an interesting impact on the bonding situation, because if we have now a very heavy central um, um, atom, so like tennessine in this case, and the trihalogen cations, which we have studied, so tennessine, and then we have here X can either be fluorine, chlorine, bromine, iodine, and so forth. Then we see that in a one component description, the angle between X, tennessine, and X would be 90 degrees and then slowly go up to about 110 degrees binding angle um, at the tennessine atom, depending on the situation, which atom we have here uh, 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 bound to the central uh, tennessine. And if we go, however, to a two component description where we switch on spin orbit coupling, then we see that this angle here is already in the beginning a bit larger. But then from iodine onwards, we are essentially getting a linear triatomic molecule with a binding angle of 180 degrees instead of 100 and say three, four, five, something like this. And this is due to the different coupling situation describing better um, the atomic structure uh, from which we then form this bond here and gives rise to this behavior. And if you want to read more uh, on this from an earlier study by Van Vuelen, they looked at livermorium and then X2 and then analyzed this carefully. So we followed just in our analysis here, the um, uh, analysis of Van Vuelen and co-workers just with the different central atom, but the logic behind this is the same. So here we see really the transition from an LS coupling situation, which becomes 
becomes the better description to a JJ coupling uh, description, which uh, then, if this is really um, describing the situation well, is giving rise um, to this enlarged um, uh, angle so that we have essentially a linear system instead of a bent one. And with this, I have completed the first longer part, and then we will have a shorter part about um, where these applications could uh, be, or where relativistic effects play a role for chirality in fundamental physics. But that might be a good point to ask some questions. Okay. Um... So first of all, you spoke um, about the the gold orbitals, um, and you discussed the operators um, that result in the orbital shifts. But um, is there an intuitive picture behind these abstract operators? Um, yes, they can be obtained um, from this bright Pauli ansatz if one, so to speak, let me see if we can find this. If we make this, expression here and pull out 2mc squared and plug this in the um, expression which we have here for our um, uh, uh, in, in our matrix form. And then one can extract, so to speak, as the various terms, this uh, p to the power of 4 term, which would be uh, then the mass velocity term. This here is then the broad bright Pauli spin orbit coupling. And then we have here the Darwin term, which comes from this kind of reduction to a two component formalism in the bright Pauli framework. So the clue is to pull out this here, then order everything according to um, the same uh, level of, of uh, alpha. And uh, then one gets uh, this as a leading order expression in the bright Pauli picture. And those would then be the four operators which are then plugged in into the previous expression. And um, then one sees the effect of the gold gold distance um, from those three operators, which are then included. So even pushing further this point of trying to get a more intuitive picture um, for, for this bonding. So what is the intuitive picture, for example, why Mercury has a low melting point? Is, is, can that oh, be and there is a completely different uh, description of um, uh, because there the the um, uh, that you have isolated uh, mercury atoms um, and not a chemical bond between two neighboring um, mm -hmm. uh, mercury atoms in the sense of a covalent bond. But here it's rather dispersion interactions and so forth, which uh, play the major role for okay. mercury. Okay. So there it, it's it's quite different. And uh, Peter Schwertfeger has done a similar study also for the rare gases. Uh, and the question, of course, if uh, organesson, so element 118, uh, is, for instance, a gas um, or um, a solid, or what would it be at room temperature? And those questions then can also uh, be addressed. And the question there is also, what is the impact then of relativistic effects on those properties? But here, as I said, it's not a covalent bond in Mercury. Therefore, this situation is completely different. Okay. So when calculating spectra of heavy atoms or molecules from first principles, how accurate can you be? What is like the most impressive level of agreement with, with experimental measurements? And what are the biggest outstanding problems? So that's very complicated to answer in, in general terms, right? Because um, one can look at, for instance, excitation energies of um, electronic excitations. One can look at excitation energies of uh, vibrations, um, of uh, rotations. Um, one can look at magnetic properties and so forth. That's very complicated to answer in, in uh, quite general terms, right? But uh, the accuracy... Um, can be very high so that we can say um, that we can achieve chemical accuracy, which means one kilojoule per mole for, for a thermochemical question. So um, uh, to, to bring uh, together uh, two atoms, for instance, and then calculate the binding energy. If one really wants to and needs this, then one can achieve chemical accuracy also in the relativistic description um, and uh, also for, for other spectroscopic quantities, 
um, one can also achieve spectroscopic accuracy, not just chemical accuracy. So that depends now on the type of spectroscopy, right? But um, say for electronic excitations, one can say, well, maybe one can go down um, to a few inverse centimeters or something uh, as, as um, excitation energies and so forth. And so in principle, um, one if one pulls all the stops, uh, one can uh, describe uh, the systems very accurately. But what is very interesting, at least from my perspective, and we will come to this point then, is to make predictions then for properties which have not been measured yet. And this makes it very interesting. So not uh, to try to achieve the best agreement with the known property, but rather make a prediction for a new property and uh, then propose an experiment where one can then hunt for seeing, for instance, for the first time, a signature of the electric dipole moment of an electron, for instance. Right? And there one really progresses into unexplored land in a sense, because it's a prediction. And there, I mean, the ultimate goal is to make a prediction and comparison to the experiment. And if there is a deviation between the experimental measurement and the theoretical prediction, then it gets very interesting because it could mean that the underlying equations are not sufficient. And that means that, for instance, one discovers physics beyond the standard model. But this means that we have to make a very accurate prediction. Mm -hmm. So maybe one final question before then we jump to the to the last part of the, the lecture. And that is, suppose I get so excited that I want to start running the calculations that you have described. How large a computer cluster do I need? How large a molecule can I consider? And then how far are the relativistic calculations heavier than the non-relativistic calculations? Yeah, that depends very much on the level one uh, tries to uh, uh, use for, for the description. So in the naive picture, if we say we do a Hartree Fock calculation, then instead of having one component, we have now to deal with four components, right? So that is, of course, an increase in the work which we have. And uh, therefore, uh, you can say, well, it can be uh, four to 16 times more complicated, be, um, but also the basis sets um, are then typically more expanded and so forth. So in a sense, say it's an order of magnitude more effort um, to do a Hartree-Fock calculation um, on a four-component level, say, than on, on a one-component level in this naive assumption, but one can pull a lot of uh, stops in order to um, uh, make calculations faster and, and then, so to speak, start with, uh, say, a two-component description. Often this is also fully sufficient, and then one can uh, try to, to figure out by perturbative arguments what is the remaining error. And um, so typically, when one uh, does um, um, relativistic calculations, um, then one really has to distinguish which type of approach one is using. And if it comes to pseudo-potential calculations, then it's like a, a conventional non-relativistic calculation. So most people who calculate gold take a pseudo-potential, have only the few electrons of the valence part of gold, and then will run their calculation and will never notice that they did a relativistic calculation. So there you can say it's as fast as a normal calculation uh, for, say, bromine or gold. Uh, it's it's the, the same effort. Right. But if one okay, wants so to include the additional effects, then it becomes more tedious. And then it depends very much on the method. OK, so we have, we have only a couple of minutes left. So okay. I suggest we jump to the to the final part. And uh, please make sure to leave uh, a bit of time at the very end. So let's say um, eight or nine minutes more lecture and then two or three minutes. of OK, yeah. Then we jump quickly into this. And so I cannot. Um, show much then, but uh, I, I will show you the, the general idea which we follow, namely that we want to use uh, molecular and uh, systems here in order to explore fundamental symmetries. And the idea is that uh, we use molecular systems as a probe for either fundamental violations for, say, discrete symmetries like space inversion, time reversal, charge conjugation, and then try to detect this on the level of um, uh, molecular systems, 
or it can happen so that we have uh, symmetries which are in principle uh, rather good, but then spontaneously broken on a higher level. And then we can try to explore this phenomenon of symmetry breaking on the level of molecular systems. And uh, so the primary goal of, of our team, for instance, is to look at molecules to detect um, violations of uh, discrete symmetries with their help and with the idea that this can perhaps be done more sensitively than with atoms or um, at colliders with the individual particles. And uh, just to um, uh, outline what the general idea is, is that we say, for instance, if we include electroweak effects in our calculations, then we have a typical parity conserving part, uh, which behaves similarly to our uh, uh, electromagnetic interactions. And then we have a parity violating contribution, which has a different symmetry. And this uh, parity conserving part is mostly the electromagnetic Hamiltonian. And then there's a weak contribution, which is very small. And then we have from the weak contribution also this parity violating contribution. And then the idea is typically in this framework that one searches for states with well-defined parity, which are the eigenstates of the parity conserving Hamiltonian. And then we can have plus and minus states. And then we can have this situation that between those plus and minus states, we have parity violating terms, which are then coupling the two states. And if those states of opposite parity are very close by, then this coupling here can give a huge contribution and make a mixing of those plus and minus states and lead to localized states, which are or left handed and right handed states, um, which are then superposition states of plus and minus states. So whatever uh, one uh, does, one tries to achieve a close uh, lying set of uh, states with opposite parity and a large off diagonal element in order to magnify the effects. And we are mostly interested in chiral molecules because here the situation is like this, that the molecule itself has also already broken symmetry. Namely, we have uh, the left-handed and right-handed molecule, which are connected by the parity operation. And then if we have the parity conserving Hamiltonian, then this is even under parity. The parity violating one is odd under parity, so change a sign. And then we can calculate for a left-handed and a right-handed molecule a parity violating potential, which has the same magnitude, but opposite sign. And this is now very interesting because in chiral molecules, we have this tunneling splitting here, which has been introduced by Hund, where we have those delocalized, very oddly looking uh, states of um, a chiral molecule, which is just a superposition plus and minus superposition. They have very close lying levels. And in the conventional assumption, we would say the splitting is large. Um, with respect to the off-diagonal element, then this here is actually also the situation which would correspond to the true eigenstates of this two-by-two two problem. If we have, however, a tun uh, tunneling splitting, which is small compared to the off-diagonal element, then, so this reverse situation, then we get the localized state and they are split by some energy difference. And this energy difference is the one which is the signature of parity violation. So in chiral molecules, the energies are very close. And so therefore, um, uh, of, of the two tunneling states, and therefore we expect a magnification here. Just in order to know how large the effect uh, is, um, we have to calculate then the parity violating contribution. And unfortunately, I cannot discuss this in all gloriful details, but just um, quickly, I would like to say that we have the scalar product of the electron spin and linear momentum. Um, this scalar product is then measured, so to speak, at the position of the nucleus. And this is a part of the operator which uh, gives, so to speak, a parity violating contribution to our Hamiltonian from the weak interaction between electrons and nuclei. So we have either electrons which are left-handed or right-handed hitting the nucleus, and then they are scattered differently. And um, the magnitude of the scattering, uh, so to speak, depends on the weak nuclear charge of the nucleus, which is essentially depending on the number of neutrons. And then we have Fermi's V constant, which makes the term very small and so forth. This would be the Schrödinger picture and the Dirac picture. We have the gamma five matrix. Um, and uh, rho A is the nuclear density distribution, which we can use then. And 
um, then there's a spin nuclear spin dependent power, which looks very much similar, apart from the fact that here then the scalar product between electron spin and nuclear spin pops in. And now we can calculate for chiral molecules um, those. Um, um, yeah, uh, uh, when we have only the electromagnetic Hamiltonian, then those two states have the same energy, but we can calculate now the tunneling splitting here and then compare this to the parity violating energy difference, which we have. And we looked at some chiral molecules like H2O2, hydrogen peroxide, which has this kind of structure here. So it's 110 degrees dihedral angle. Then we looked at the uh, tunneling splitting, which one can have and calculate this. And this is also experimentally known to be around 11 inverse centimeters or 0.3 terahertz, or if you like atomic units, uh, Hartree units, and it's 50 micro Hartree. That's the tunneling splitting here in the lowest level. So that's a very huge tunneling splitting. Um, and therefore, uh, the admixture of parity uh, violating effects would be very small. But one can go down the periodic table and look at H2O2, S2, selenium-2, tellurium-2, and even be brave and look at polonium-2. And then the tunneling splitting goes very much down, uh, down to 10 to the minus 9 or 10 to the minus 10 inverse centimeters or even lower if we go from the hydrogen system to the deuterated or even tritiated system. And then it becomes very interesting because uh, here for S2Cl2, which has a similar structure, we have then calculated the, the tunneling splitting compared to the parity violating energy difference. And this is very much larger than this tunneling split. So here we know that uh, for such a molecule, parity violation is a huge effect as compared to tunneling. And uh, therefore we have, have a huge uh, enhancement, so to speak, of those effects. And now, we can look at other molecules like H2X2 series, go down the periodic table, and then we see that the parity violating effects dramatically increase with uh, increasing nuclear charge. And we see a steep scaling Z to the power of five plus minus one roughly. So if we go down from H2O2 down to H2 polonium2, we get a very large splitting. And here we have done a two component calculation on the density functional theory level. Here's a four component uh, calculation as a comparison. Uh, and the deviation is below 1%, right? So quasi relativistic and relativistic give for this uh, property essentially the same uh, sizes. Now, one, uh, I have to skip this part, how to detect this in this kind of meta wave interference experiment. But one popular route is to look at um, uh, vibrational frequency splittings of chiral molecules. That is one experiment when one uh, tries to measure not directly the energy difference, but rather the differences of energy levels of the left-hand side and the right-hand side, which are differently shifted due to the parity violating potential of a chiral molecule, which is then separated by this kind of barrier. And then one would look for a difference between those two transition frequencies. And that is an experiment which has actually been done in the group of Chardonnay. And they've provided an upper bound for the CF stretching frequency in this molecule of 10 to the minus 13 inverse centimeters. So delta nu over nu. So the transition frequency is around 1000 inverse centimeters. And that is, so to speak, the relative ratio. Now the question is how far away is this molecule from um, uh, giving an effect which is measurable? And this is here a comparison of calculations by us, but there are also other calculations in a four component framework, also in a scalar relativistic framework with uh, parity violate, uh, with spin orbit effects added um, perturbatively. And here is the computed effect size compared to what is the unit of the measurement. And then you see uh, here three orders of magnitude would be missing. Right? But um, one can modify the system and go to heavier nuclei. And by this, one gets a mild increase by, say, one order of magnitude here, or uh, maybe two orders of magnitude. But if one goes to very heavy nuclei like estatine, one would be roughly on the order of the experimental resolution of some 20 years ago. Right? But the price to pay is, of course, that one has to deal with radioactive molecules, and that's another challenge. And I will just show you one additional piece and more we cannot do uh, due to time reason. Um, namely, one can also use those chiral molecules and try to probe, for instance, dark matter with those. 
because there are some discussions about what the property of dark uh, matter uh, could be. So if one has, for instance, pseudo-scalar cosmic fields or pseudo-vector cosmic fields, which are interacting them with molecules. And interestingly enough, this gamma-5 matrix here pops up in the two operators here. And then one can check if, for instance, a chiral molecule could be probing um, the um, uh, a certain um, feature in, in um, uh, dark, uh, uh, dark matter particles. And we have reanalyzed a previous experiment. Let me see if I can go to okay, this. Okay, Robert, slide. let me, let me jump in here because we're really about to run over time. And, yeah. and let me maybe um, close this, this seminar with one final question. Yes, please. Um, and, and that is, so of all the contributions to fundamental physics that we might see uh, from measurements and calculations on, on molecules, which do you think is the most likely to occur in the next few years? So, for example, will measurements on molecules be able to rule out or in major alternatives to the standard model? Yes, one experiment which is very promising uh, is to measure an electric dipole moment of an electron. And this is something um, where there are uh, predictions. So from our side, we can calculate the molecular enhancement factor for an electric dipole moment of an electron, for instance, in radium fluoride. And this is ongoing research where there are experiments which try to probe this electric dipole moment of the electron. And if we know the molecular enhancement factor from this, we can, from a measurement of an dipole moment of the molecule, but here, um, so to speak, permanent dipole moment, not an intrinsic one in the molecular frame, uh, infer what the dipole moment of an electron is. And here is um, a graph, I think I should see if I have this here. This is what the current standard model would predict. Here are the measurements for ytterbium fluoride, uh, hafnium fluoride plus thorium oxide, um, they have already ruled out some alternatives to the standard model. Uh, some are in the range, and this is roughly where the diatomics are heading for. Uh, so 10 to the minus 30 E times centimeters for an electric dipole moment of the electron. And this is a very active research direction where molecules are in the lead. Uh, the old thallium experiment had um, uh, was, uh, so to speak, then uh, surpassed by the molecular experiments. And so there it's clear um, that molecular systems have the best prospects, I would say, um, to, to make their progress. But of course, nobody knows if there is an electric dipole moment of the electron beyond the standard one, right? So that's a very okay. interesting test. So I think that's a good point to stop. Thank you. And I'm handing back over to Andrew. Yeah, um, so thank you very much again, uh, uh, Robert, sort of also from um, from my side. Um, and um, yeah, thank you to, to everyone who's um, who's been watching. Um, please, if you're um, interested in uh, seeing um, uh, schedules and information um, uh, about further quantum science seminars, please go to our, our website in the new year, um, quantumscienceseminar.com, um, or subscribe to our mailing list or um, follow us on Twitter. Um, in the meantime, also please um, uh, check out our um, sister seminar, the, the virtual AMO seminar. Um, they have uh, one more talk this year, um, which is uh, Friday next week, uh, December the 16th. Um, uh, we are Hannes Bernian from the University of Chicago will be talking about uh, building dual species quantum processes. Um, in the meantime, um, that's us for this year for the quantum science seminar. Um, so happy holidays to everyone. Um, and um, again, please keep in touch via, via Twitter and the website. Thanks, everyone, and uh, see you later. Bye.